Right, good evening, folks. Um, sort of that um, edge between the evening and the afternoon. Um, <clears throat> interesting today, we've already done this talk live once to a, an audience, and that was down at the Holy Collection. We did have some um, objects in the ephemera out there. We haven't got the advantage of that here tonight, but obviously we, we are essentially tackling the same subject. This is part of the Name on the Knife Blade project, and it's part of a series of talks we've done. So I'll just tell you a little bit about the Hawley Collection and the context where we're starting here. So I'm a volunteer at the Hawley Collection, been volunteering there for about seven or eight years now. And um, it's a collection of in the region of 100,000 items. It's housed at Kellam Island Museum. It's a separate trust. Um, and Ken Hawley uh, collected lots of things to do with tools in Sheffield. And he also collected anything to do with cutlery and cutlery companies. And one of the things we've been amassing over a period of time is we've been amassing sort of histories of the different companies. And uh, as we give these talks and take the lid off the different companies, um, there's always some little gems actually about every one of the companies and certainly Mapping and Web um, are no surprise in there. And we put there a company with a flair for design. And, you know, we, I, I could also say maybe Mapping and Web a company with a flair for extravagance because that, that, that's a sort of typical typical feature of what they'd be interested in. Um, one of the reasons I'm involved in doing this is I just love Sheffield and there's nothing epitomizes Sheffield more than the Sheffield cutlery industry and the flatware and hollowware. So I'm um, going to run through this. There's some pages that have just got quite a lot of text on them, but you'd be pleased to hear there's lots of pages that have just got beautiful objects just for us to look at and enjoy. And I would hope that at the end of this, you all go back to your, um, your cutlery drawn, maybe your your silverware in store and you just look and see have you got anything by mapping and web and and to celebrate that so uh, let's get started so the early days um mapping and web go back to 1774 well mapping the name mapping goes back to 1774 and jonathan mapping was a silver plate worker now it doesn't say they're an electro plate silver worker so this was a much more primitive process of uh, silver plating than, than the silver plate uh, processes that came in in the, the mid-1800s. Uh, so in 1775, he registered a silver mark in Fargate. Now, it's quite interesting, isn't it, just as thinking about Fargate as we know it today. Um, we think about it as a, a, a retail area that's going through something of a transition, but we don't think about it as being actually a place of industry and it's fair to say that I think off the sides of Fargate, there were all sorts of industry and, and all sorts of workshops uh, that were taking place there. We often found that individual people working in the trade would link up with somebody else. So, uh, so 1775, he registered a silver mark, but he'd also joined up with William Barrack. Now, we don't hear anything more about William Barrack, but I suppose in the context of the name on a knife blade, there's another name attached to Sheffield Cutlers. 1787, He's listed as a maker of clasps and dog collars. And it's funny, until today, I suppose, I was always imagining, I don't know why, but clerical dog collars. And of course, a cutlery company wouldn't really be that interested in making linen collars, I don't think. But um, obviously, these would have been metal collars for dogs. And the clasps, well, they could have been belt clasps. And one of the other things that some of these companies often made is they often made buckles um, for shoes. So he had a son, Joseph Mappin. And 1776, 1765 to 18, 18, uh, 1846, he was an engraver and a copper plate printer. So Joseph married Hannah Newton and she had two sons. One was John Newton Mapping. He made a fortune in the brewing industry and bequeathed the Mapping Art Gallery. So these cutlery families have left a legacy in Sheffield, but one of the things it'd be quite easy to imagine that the Mapping Art Gallery came from. Uh, the Mappin brothers on Mappin and Webb, where in reality it came from somebody in the Mappin family who made their money from brewing, but they didn't make their money from cutlery, flatware and hollowware. The other son, Joseph Jr., joined his father in the business and the business became Joseph Mappin and Son. Joseph Sr. diversified into pearl buttons, spoon and dessert handles of the finest quality. Um, hand, often dessert cutlery um, may have had mother of pearl handles and we have a wonderful video um, that we can access from the Yorkshire Film Archive that shows um, people unpacking crates full of 
mother of pearl shells that were the size of dinner plates. And obviously there's quite an industry in Sheffield turning those uh, mother of pearl shells into handles, buttons, and a whole range of other items. And what was left over at the end of all that was used to make a, a cruise form of toothpaste. The other thing in 1883, he registered a silver mark. So this is, you know, Joseph and Sons in Pepper Alley. By 1826, Joseph Jr. Uh, had left his father and he'd gone his own way and he joined it with another sort of good sounding Sheffield name, George Arundel. And George Arundel, a pen, it maybe, I don't know what you should say pen knife there, but a pen and razor manufacturer. So they had a new enterprise known as Arundel and Mappin in Air Lane, somewhere off Air Street, making pen, spring, sportsman's knives and table knives and razors. 1835, as happens in many partnerships, George Arundel retired. Joseph's son Frederick came into the firm aged 14 and by all accounts Frederick was quite a bright button and the same year they were granted their freedom by the Cutler's company and you can see this I suppose the first corporate mark that was being used by the company and it's this figure of a son. Quite a challenge in Sheffield when you were getting awarded a mark by the Cutler's company to actually think what symbol can we come up that doesn't look like anybody else's. Um, I was quite pleased because I've actually got, a, I have an object in my possession that has that mark on it. <clears throat> so you can see on the left, it says Mappin Brothers. Interesting, it says, well, Regent Street and, well, it looks like London Bridge. Um, so more of that later. Um, interesting if you wanna look at the object on the right and the object on the right I have in front of me, but you can see the picture, probably about six inches in terms of its, um, width and probably about five inches in terms of its height and I think it's fair to say that normally when I get this object out and show it to people <clears throat> they have no idea what it's for. Clearly it would have been a statement piece in the middle of a table um, and you can see there is actually a hole in the top. The top would have been filled with hot water and it would have been used for warming your spoons. Um, this particular piece has got a well quite an interesting history because in good condition, one of these can cost £300. I was lucky enough to buy this for £7.50 in a totally battered state because it had been used as a doorstop and all the silver plate had worn off. I was giving a talk about cutlery for afternoon tea at the Portland Works and Paul Izzard from the Sheffield shop, he took this downstairs to the silver plater and he came back to me with a quote for £30 having it replated so I actually thought that was quite reasonable so I've now got a silver plated spoon warmer but with the lovely mark of Mappin Brothers on the base. Joseph Mappin moving to Mulberry Street 1837 then to Norfolk Street so lots of moving around the city centre. By 1839 the company was able to produce expensive exhibition pieces and there was a great exhibition at Crystal Palace there was exhibitions in Paris. So, um, you know, Sheffield Cutlers wanted to prove what could they do and they, they would produce these uh, specialist pieces. By 1840, the firm employed 100 people. Um, 1841, Joseph Senior and Joseph Junior both died. So Frederick took over running the company and he was reckoned to be a very astute businessman. But it's interesting, you can almost point to this point in 1841, when the focus of the business almost shifted to London. They opened a London shop and they registered a silver mark. 1851, they opened a substantial works, the Queen's Plate and Silver Works in Norfolk Street. And they initially traded as Mappin and Brothers, getting rid of the name Joseph Mappin, which had been in the title. So by 1852, we only had one family business, Mapping Brothers. Uh, here's a picture of those, those works. Um, rather nice, these sort of uh, hand-drawn, engraved pictures that you can often find either in the old catalogues of the company, or you can sometimes find them uh, in things like Pawson's History of Sheffield uh, in 1870. Interesting, if you go on the internet looking for pictures of the Mappin Brothers, you'll actually find that there's, you know, there's people in America selling this image for 
20, 30 pounds. Um, I think it's fairly safe to say that these images will be out of copyright because certainly this picture is more than 70 years old. Um, by all accounts, this makes the factory look significantly better organized than it actually was. And behind this sort of entrance, one view is that essentially it was lots and lots of little work workshops. But um, I guess the people in the foreground in there going around in their carriages gives you a bit of an interesting flavor. You know, if you think of the raw materials arriving at this works, the, the product going out, but they were all going out on a horse and cart. And if you were talking about sending the goods to America or London or maybe Europe, then it was quite a challenge thinking about, you know, what was the associated transport that went with that. Sort of notion about many of the Sheffield companies were at their peak, maybe between 1850 and uh, 1910. So they won, they won prizes at the great exhibitions for sportsmen's knives. They were well known for sportsmen's knives, Bowie knives, shilling razors, superior table cutlery, pruners and electro plates. Uh, they were renowned on the continent for anti garrote knives and uh, so this was to prevent you, you know, you being damaged around the neck by somebody coming up behind you. So um, interesting. I'd quite like to see one of those objects. They were appointed cutlers to Queen Victoria. And I think it's fair to say Mappin and Webb probably still use that same warrant now, even though they're a slightly different business. By 1861, they were boasting three London showrooms. And a, a, a bit of a notion there, you know, luxury goods, what was the demand for luxury goods in Sheffield? What was the demand for luxury goods in London? And I think you can imagine the demand in London would have been significantly greater. Frederick was um, busy going on making selling trips across Europe. So he was keen to get the products out and probably had a greater European perspective than many of the other cutlery companies in Sheffield. And in 1855, at the age of 34, he became the master cutler. Um, Obviously, the Master Cutler's office is still going, um, not that far away from its 400th anniversary. And um, but in, in those days, I think you probably did have to come from a cutlery company to be the Master Cutler. Nowadays, there's a slightly broader, inter broader interpretation and it, uh, prominent industrialists can actually become Master Cutler. Uh, well, in 1857, the younger brothers fell out. So Edward and John Charles purchased the right to Mappin Brothers. Frederick became a senior partner in another cutlery company, Thomas Turton. He was knighted in 1886 and became an MP. Not sure whether that was an MP in Sheffield or whether it was further afield, but he died at Thornbury in 1810. Now I guess Thornbury, um, sorry, I think I should say, ooh dates wrong on that something but it, when he died at Thornbury that's one of the big mansions in Sheffield um, that's where Thornbury private hospital is today and obviously we've got quite a significant cluster of uh, big houses in Fulwood where we had the um where, where we had the mansions of these cutlers now one of the interesting things is he left 931,000 pounds now 931,000 pounds is somewhere in the order of today's money of perhaps a billion, between a billion and one and a half billion. And I think Frederick Mappin was probably the richest of all the cutlers that I've come across. Um, and, you know, so clearly they were, they were operating the business and they were taking quite a lot of money out of the business for their own personal fortunes, but the businesses were, were still doing very well. Their brother, John, who had fallen out with the other two brothers, decided to launch his own business doing electroplating and cutlery. And he formed a company called Mappin and Co at the Royal Cutlery Works in Pond Hill. And in 1960, registered a silver mark as Mappin and Co. Needless to say, Mappin brothers weren't that pleased about having another company in Sheffield called Mappin and Co. So they were, Mappin brothers were busy suing uh, Mappin and Co uh, for using the same name. And that's something that actually went on for quite a while. Um, so this is, this is a picture of the Royal Works, um, which, was, um, which was put into practice by, by, the, by the brothers, Mappin brothers. Um, and it's a bit later on this Mappin and Webb, but one of the interesting things about this, just look at the address at the top. Where's the mention of Sheffield in big letters? It's saying 
Oxford Street and 158 to 162. So, you know, three different residences that presumably have been knocked together in Oxford Street, but that wouldn't have been cheap. You've also got another address there, 220 Regent Street. Now, again, Regent Street sounds like a pretty posh London address. And then two Queen, sorry, two Queen Victoria Street. So um, you can see there that we've got um, we've got this concentration already of prominent buildings in London. Um, and that, that was a constant focus. And if you're going to sell luxury goods, well, perhaps that's the place you want to sell them. So basically, we've got this parallel universe of the mappings. So on the left hand side, we've got John Mappin, who was very much London based. In 1860, he married George Webb, a merchant's daughter. So hence, we get that final bit of the jigsaw in terms of the name. We get the Webb bit actually appearing in the picture. So by 1868, they were known as Mappin and Webb and Co. They were expanding that royal works that we saw in the previous picture. 1872, they commissioned a new head office in London Mansion House. Now, I don't know, I've been to the Mansion House in London, and that's certainly uh, pretty smart, pretty high status. Um, so whether that's the same place or not, but potentially it is, and it's, it's, it gives you a leaning of where this company was going. 1880, Mapping and Webb, further expansion into the luxury goods market. And in 1890, they promoted their products under the brand Princess Plate. Mappin Brothers, intensely competitive with their brother, um, lost the legal battle over the name, but they were still in dispute up to 1890. Good quality products, winning awards, but losing ground on the rivals. Workforce between 150 and 200. 1883, family members had died out and the company became run by Hickson and Crockford. I certainly know of at least one other person, one of my friends who was called Crockford. So again, a sense of that being another local name. 1890, they were sold to partners in the Goldsmith and Silversmith Company, but in 1902, John Mappin from Mappin & Co acquired Mappin Brothers. So again, 1902, we back to this point where all the Mappin companies have come back together and we have a single company. Well, I've sort of hinted that one of the things that actually, you know, Mappin Brothers went for is they went for the luxury market. And again, at the Hawley Collection, we're very fortunate. We've got lots and lots of catalogues. And I think it's fair to say the one on the left is a Hawley Collection, the one on the right I, I, I purchased quite recently. And um, these catalogues so ooze a little bit more luxury from the front cover of them than some of the others do. And... You know, that notion of the arts and crafts movement, um, the William Morris type type thing, um, you know, Art Nouveau, they're, they're all oozing out that, 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 that sort of quality notion. Interestingly, on the one on the left, you know, again, where's the mention of Sheffield there? Um, it's saying Oxford Street. And of course, it is saying they Mappin and Webb and Mappin Brothers. Again, going back to say established in 1810. The one on the right, interestingly, um, the, the only uh, clue is you, in the middle there, next to the, underneath that sort of circular cup or glass mark, there's actually a royal, um, the, the royal sort of standard is there, the royal, uh, the, the royal mark. And, um, and, and actually there's no mention on the front at all that that's even a Mapping and Webb uh, catalogue. It does say Mapping and Webb actually on the spine of that, uh, on the spine of the item. And I say, just, just looking at this theory and about what does luxury look like. So <clears throat> essentially these talks, they're a combination of the history and some of the objects. <clears throat> I thought I'd look for one of the more expensive items in the, uh, the catalogue. So this is a tiara. And it does say forming necklace. So maybe you, <clears throat> you had a bit of flexibility what you could do with this object. Lustrous diamonds of fine quality, presumably with a gold, silver, or platinum setting. Again, you know, look at that mention of Oxford Street underneath. Um, in the, this catalog, this has come out of that, that white catalog on the last page. The first 50 pages are all about either jewelry or clocks or watches. Um, and that's not typical of a Sheffield uh, catalog. Very few of the other Sheffield cutlery manufacturers actually had any jewelry at all in their catalog. So from, from quite early on, really, 
Mappin, Mappin and Webb, Mappin and Brothers made a bit of a big deal about the jewellery. Now, um, you can look up these <clears throat> prices. If we assume that this catalogue is from 1930, then £850 in 1930 is actually equivalent of 500, sorry, £56,000 today. So if you had a necklace at home that was worth £56,000, I suspect you wouldn't just be keeping it in your dressing table drawer. Uh, you'd need to keep it somewhere valuable. But again, what was the sort of market that was being aimed at here where people were thinking of spending the equivalent of today's money, £56,000 on a tiara? I don't know how often people wore tiaras in those days. Certainly it's quite rare now. Carrying on the luxury theme, solid gold bags. <clears throat> Quite interesting. We've got these, you know, how on earth did they knit gold wire? Um, obviously an intricate process. And you could have had solid gold on the left, or you could have had platinum and gold bags, the items on the right. If they were £150, which is one of the price tags we've got on there, again, that would have been the equivalent of £10,000. Now, I suppose <clears throat> these don't look like your average handbag. I think they do look like the sort of bags that you would be taking out maybe uh, in the evening, but um, you would need the change for £10,000 to, 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 to use one of these. And I think, again, if you went out in Sheffield, or some other city wearing a, you know, with a bag over your shoulder that costs £10,000, there might be a likelihood that somebody might want to steal it from you. Almost a sense of, we would have found a, a, a posh tea and coffee set in almost every Sheffield Cutlery catalogue, but this is, you know, a particularly nice one. You can see the teapot in the middle. It's got a, probably got a burner underneath where you could have had, um, you'd have been burning paraffin or some other spirit to uh, keep the hot water, um, hot before you were rather than maybe you didn't you know you couldn't resort to an electric kettle in those days and you've got you've got the teapot and you've got the milk jug um and, and, and all that coming together but again you know um kettles and stand four pints with spirit lamp 50 pounds and um so again that wasn't an, an, an insubstantial um amount of money just in the catalogue you know oval presentation centerpiece in sterling silver um it is interesting, this notion about things that you wanted to put in the middle of the table. Probably now, most people in the middle of the table would have a couple of placemats that would not want to put the dishes down. But clearly there was a point here where if you had money, um, and you know, one of the things you would do with your friends, you would, you would, you would have fine dining, and you would want some significant centerpiece in the middle of the table um, to, to Im 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 impress your your, your neighbours and your friends. And again, you know, this was 90 pounds, which again, wouldn't have been an insubstantial uh, amount of money. Um, the Midsummer Night's Dream Bowl. This is, you know, rich, sorry, richly fluted, chased and pierced with scrolls and foliage in Italian style. The panel beautifully modelled in high relief and finely chased, illustrating a scene from Shakespeare's comedy. Um, 13 and a quarter inches high, extreme length, 20 inches. Well, th this really sums up Mappin and Webb. Um, they were quite big on dressing table sets, but this was the ladies fitted traveling case version. And if you look at the range of items there, it may be all the items are displayed twice in the sense that you've got it showing the case packed and the case unpacked. Either way though, I think we've got a significant level of extravagance. I love the fact in the middle there, you've got a little clock. Um, to the left of that, you've got, you know, some sort of a hair curling device. Um, you've got a little hook on the bottom, which could have been for tightening corsets or could have been for your uh, tightening, tightening your laces. Uh, we've got a whole manicure set. We've got a number of um, boxes for various different things. And I think the description is quite interesting. Ladies finest selected crocodile skin fitted traveling case lined very rich moire silk, completely fitted with very beautiful solid tortoiseshell toilet requisites inlaid with solid silver, Adam's design, finest cut and engraved glass, all en suite, making a very charming case complete with selvit cover. And yours for the grand total of £125. Now, if you were going away as a couple, of course, 
we couldn't have had the lady having a more grand um you know set up than the man so the male equivalent is also available um and of course you can have this one with solid gold fittings up to 750 pounds um you know again crocodile skin similar sort of arrangement um there's a flask in there now is you know is that for eau de cologne or is that for whiskey um we, we've got we've got a clock in the middle then we've got a couple of devices um they're there in the very middle of the picture where the reflection is but they're also at the back of the cases and i'm not really sure what they are for at all they look like they've got a pull handle um again whether they're for gentlemen's laces they might have had boots that were laced up um you know gentlemen's manicure set lots of crocodile skin everywhere brushes of all descriptions and um well, you know, if you're packing to go away, I think you can imagine those sort of people going on, on, on a railway journey with the butler and having lots and lots of cases stacked up on top of each other. And this would have been part of that essential accoutrement if you were going to travel on your journey. It's quite rare in a, essentially a cutlery catalogue to have um, coloured, uh, you know, any, any, any sort of colouring. So um, in the mapping and web catalogue, you do get a few colouring things here. <clears throat> and you've got some rather grand clocks. Presumably these would, well, certainly lots. Some of the items, this, you know, maybe the mechanism certainly would have been bought in. Um, perhaps, I don't know whether some of the faces would have been made by them. But again, you know, mapping and web limited, eight day timepieces. And again, across the bottom, Queen Victoria Street, Regent Street, Oxford Street, no mention of Sheffield, um, and they're clearly going for that luxury market, that massively expanding middle class um, and upper class, you know, people who've got money in the London area. So basically, Map and Web are prospering. <clears throat> they adopted a new trademark, 1869, the M and the Trustworthy. Certainly, that's something that we'll see on knives. 1890, they also adopted the, the, the brand Prince's Plate. And it was interesting talking to a couple of people this afternoon who were saying, um, you know, people in their family had had rings that had been made by Mappin and Webb. And whether um, you certainly wouldn't have got the um, all the logo at the bottom on a ring, you might have got the word trustworthy on a ring, or you might have had some scale down version next to a hallmark, uh, maybe, just a, maybe just an M and a W. So 1896, they'd got that royal warrant from Queen Victoria, say so it's probably still being used. Um, 1898, they became a limited company with a capitalised at two, you know, quarter of a million. Now, in today's money, that would be 31 million. Ten years later, they were restructuring to include all the assets of Mappin Brothers who they'd taken over. Um, and by then, their capital was actually 400,000, again, equivalent of 50 million in today's money. They established a sort of sub-company, the Sheffield Silver Plate and Cutlery, for mass-produced cutlery. 1902, the catalogue had 264 pages. And I think it's fair to say, if you've not seen one of these catalogues, um, you know, 264 pages. On every page, there might be 10, 20, 30 pages that were all originally, um, every item would have been individually typeset. So... A single page of a cutlery catalogue would have produced maybe 20 printing blocks. One of the things we've got in the Holy Collection, actually, we have thousands of the printing blocks from uh, different Sheffield manufacturers. And they, they do tell a story, but a bit of a challenge about how we display them. But, they, you know, so the catalogue, as well as the luxury items, table knives, double shear steel, sporting knives, spoons, forks, carving sets. So 1902, of course, uh, we've got silver plate, which was um, very popular and we hadn't had stainless steel had not been invented yet, but double shear steel was, you know, very good quality metal. It was perfect for cutting anything. The emphasis on electroplate and sterling silver goods, tea, coffee sets, candlesticks, salvers, toast rack, presentation and communion plate. As far as I know, the only company, uh, Sheffield company that I've seen so far that actually had a separate catalogue for communion plate was in fact um, Mappin and Webb. Uh, interesting, I suppose I come from a Catholic background, so looking at this, uh, looking at this collection, this looks very Anglican to me, uh, and I guess Anglican churches certainly around that time would have outnumbered Catholic churches significantly. Um, so this was the go-to place if you were in a Church of England church and you wanted to buy, you wanted to buy some silver items, 
uh, or gold items, in fact, for your, your chalice and your other holding hosts and things like that. Right, new name appearing on the scene, Wallace Smythe. And I put Wallace Smythe does Ken a favour, Ken being Ken Hawley. So Wallace Smythe was 14 and he went to the School of Art on Mapping Street. Wallace Cockford Smythe was born in 1901 and he actually lived, sorry, 1910, and he actually lived to be 101. And one of the things there, I think when he was 99, he did actually manage to go to, somebody did an exhibition of his work and he was actually able to go to that. So that was fantastic. Um, at the age of 16 in 1927, he went to work in the studios at Mapping and Webbs and he ultimately became the head of design. And he designed practical and decorative silverware for the home market. He also did special commissions for all over the world. And he rescued the original designs from the company. And also, as I've since learned, the photographs of many of those products and donated them to the Hawley Collection. And um, one of the joys of uh, doing this talk was actually delving into some of those drawers and just picking some of those interesting items. And I'm just going to give you a little bit of a flavour. And the other thing, actually, this is really nice for the Hawley Collection, because at the Hawley Collection, we're not just interested in the finished products. We're interested in the process of how we got there. And I think it's easy to forget when we're looking at a finished product that actually somebody had to design it in the first place. And certainly Walter Cock Cockcroft Smythe was a real... Um, an excellent designer. So people would have come along and said, you know, I want a gold cup. And actually these are two of the, two of the drawings we've got. Um, sometimes we find there's a stage where there's a pencil sketch and then we'll come on to a colored sketch. I think we don't know what either of these were for. Um, a couple of our colleague volunteers have actually been working on trying to track down some of these items um, and it's not easy. Um, so some of them we know where they've gone to, some of them we know who they were commissioned by, others um, we, we've got lovely images like this and certainly you know if these things were solid gold they weren't cheap. Um, he seems to have had a habit Wallace of colouring in the bases of these things green when the actual objects came out they weren't necessarily green. This is quite nice, um, so this is a a horse racing trophy and so this was the drawing and this was the actual trophy and if I just flip back between the two actually well the, the, the trophy very much reflected um, the original drawing it was very true to that the position of the grass the position of the fence uh, the position of the riders and we do know that this was this was for Windsor Lad who was a derby winner um, I'm not sure if you win the derby, I suspect you might get quite a lot of trophies and it doesn't look like this was a perpetual trophy, i.e. awarded every year. This looks like, I suspect it was a one-off trophy, but who knows, somebody out there who knows more about horse racing than I do, could, this trophy could still be being awarded and um, might say a bit more about trophies in a minute. You know, I think we have to remember Sheffield was the go-to place for the whole world to come if you wanted a trophy. Um, now this, and, and uh, you know, as recently as 1957, um, the Trinidad Turf Club, they could, you know, they're much nearer to America. Surely somebody in America could have turned out a trophy like this. No, they wanted the best. And if they wanted the best, they were going to come to Sheffield. Um, and this is the Diamond Jubilee hand clap, hand, hand cap, Handicap. Some similar maybe uh, features of that horse as it into the last one, but also weight of 75 ounces, and that's 75 ounces of silver. Um, quite a few of the most famous trophies, so the BBC Sports Personality Trophy of the Year, for instance, that was made by Walker and Hall, and we know the designer. I think the Golf Masters Trophy, um, that was made in Sheffield. Um, the Schneider Trophy for the race across the Atlantic, that was made in Sheffield. There is no end of the most prominent trophies in the world were all made and designed in Sheffield. Uh, quite nice, a sort of um, national trophy for ladies badminton. Um, quite interesting. So it says the national trophy, which I've maybe read. I wonder if maybe it should say the international trophy for ladies badminton, because um, the fact we've got a globe on there um, and you know, whether that was ever actually made, not quite sure. Um, 
This is a trophy that was commissioned in the 19, uh, 1961. And if you look on the, the left-hand side picture, there's something there about what was commissioned. So they wanted a plinth that would take the names of four winners annually. They wanted eight replicas of the trophy. They did not want a figure of a golfer on top of it. They wanted something that was more dignified. They wanted the cost not to exceed 800 or 900 pounds. They wanted two different designs submitted. The trophy finally came out looking like this. So it's called a Putra Trophy. Um, and one of the volunteers from the Holy Collection, who was a golfer, actually went to this golf club um, and mentioned there'd been a trophy that had been made in Sheffield. And he was shown this trophy. And then he was actually treated to a slap up dinner in honor of the fact that he'd, 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 he'd come out to done this. So perhaps as volunteers from Holy, we should, we should be chasing more of these trophies down and finding the great and grand places where they've actually ended up. You know, when we see, I don't know, when you see the, the Lord Mayor's procession or the Cutler's procession, you know, civic maces and things. And um, I, I can only use my own example. You know, I come from Middlesbrough, which has a bit of an identity crisis because it, it was Middlesbrough. Then it became Teesside. Then it became Cleveland. Then it went back becoming Middlesbrough. And sometimes it's even called Tees Valley now. And sometimes when you had these reorganisations of local government, you would have needed a new set of regalia. Um, for the, you know, for the tier of government that you had. So presumably when South Yorkshire Council was formed in 1974, they would have decided they needed, a, they would have needed a mayoral chain and they might have needed a new mace. And a company like Mapping and Web would have been able to provide those sorts of things. Um, presentation boxes. A bit of a sense of what do you give the person that's got everything? The one on the left's quite interesting because it talks about the freedom of the City of London presented to the Right Honourable Neville Chamberlain, Prime Minister in 1939. Now, if we think about 1939 and Neville Chamberlain, obviously at the start of that period, he was our Prime Minister and very well respected. Somewhat later in that period, he came back with what he thought was a deal with Hitler, waving a piece of paper saying, I'm bringing peace back but actually became a bit discredited. And we think that this piece on the left was commissioned, but never actually presented to Neville Chamberlain. Not sure, but that's quite an interesting story. The box on the right, um, if you look at the coat of arms, you'd recognize that as the Sheffield coat of arms. And that was being taken on an official visit to Bochum in September, 1960. Now, again, there may be somebody out there who knows when the twinning arrangement with Bochum actually was um, started. But certainly whether this was an early bit of the that arrangement and this was a gesture of friendship. Um, it's fair to say that I think we don't hear so much about oh, twinning with Bochum these days as we used to in the past. But again, you know, certainly so in 1960, it was possible to go to Mapping and Web and get a, a commissioned item that you were going to be able to take to, uh, to Bochum. This afternoon, I actually had this object out and we have this in the collection. And it's interesting, the, a couple of things. So we've got that notion of different sketches at different stages. You know, we've got one possibility just in pure gold, another one that gold and enamel. The one on the right says the board for the Sheffield Regional Hospital area. But the actual medallion that we've got actually says the board for the Trent Regional um, I think it might say health authority. Um, so it, again, it's interesting, while something was being made, the, the, the boundaries, the area might have changed. And again, there must be so many organisations that had a chain of office um, that now has sort of become redundant because the organisation's changed its name um, or, it, or it's been reorganised. And I don't know, I suppose maybe at some point, the, you know, the last person who was awarded these might be the person that's actually uh, been left holding it. Quite an interesting uh, thing here, the Amy Johnson salver, uh, made in the shape of Australia. Didn't quite realise that Amy Johnson had Sheffield connections and she'd done a degree in Sheffield. But this was commissioned by the members of the fishing industry of Kingston-upon-Hull 
to commemorate a great solo flight from England to Australia between the 5th and the 24th of May. And we've got the route uh, marked on there. We've got a sort of inlay of um, Europe, Africa, um, and, and Australia. Um, we, we've got sort of uh, fish, shells, seaweed, and seahorses uh, decorating the outside. Um, so really quite an interesting thing. And th that salve, we know where that is. That's part of the Amy Johnson collection at Sewerby Hall near Bridlington, bequeathed by Amy's father in 1958. So we've got any people on here that regularly visit Bridlington. Might be quite interesting if you were able to uh, find this object. Now, one of the joys about working at the Holy Collection is you'll come across things that you didn't expect and you didn't know they were there. And certainly, I had no idea that Mappin and Webb had designed Lonsdale belts for British boxing champions. And you know, it's quite nice. So at the top there, you can see we've got a, in the early stages of the design. At the bottom, I think that's a photograph of the real thing. Now. I don't know at this stage how many other companies were involved in making Lonsdale belts. I don't know when the first Lonsdale belt was made, but clearly this was something that Mappin and Webb were engaged in. Quite pertinent for Sheffield, because obviously at the moment, Sheffield is essentially the home of British boxing, the English Institute of Sport in Attercliffe. That's where all, British, all the Olympians, all the British Olympian boxers train. Um, that's where Anthony, Anthony Joshua was fighting the other night. He trains there. so. So maybe a link that we haven't made before that, you know, how significant some of these wonderful things to do with boxing um, were made by Mappin and Webb and have related to the city. Um, and here we've got Henry Cooper um, with one of these said belts. And um, sadly, this was Henry selling his belts because he's actually perhaps he was a little bit short of money. Um, or, or maybe just he had so many of them that he, you know, he thought he might as well dispose of a few, but quite nice to attach a sort of a personality that lots of us can remember with one of the said belts. This was made for Lord Nuffield. Now, again, uh, Nuffield is quite a prominent name. He was obviously a man who had significant money. Um, some mention of a family party on that card so sounds like this was a bit of a bit of a presentation to his to him from his family um i'm not quite sure what nuffield's role was in terms of the morris minor let's think perhaps maybe he had some role in designing that but the so this is a sterling silver gilt model of the morris minor thousand fully scaled to one tenth of the original size the engine gearbox transmission, tyres, including spare wheel, toolkit, battery are fully modelled. The triplex windows wind up and down and the side ventilators swivel. Doors, bonnet and boot open, driver's seat is adjustable. So again, just a, a fabulous item that, you know, designed by Wallace, but then would have gone on to be made by the craftspeople who worked work for Mapping and Webb. And, you know, well, that is, you know, a lot of these things have been shown recently, they're one-offs. Um, and it's just fabulous just thinking that Sheffield's craft skills could actually make these things. Um, <clears throat> you, know, interest, you know, interesting where they are now. I'm sure the family will still be treasuring that somewhere, but it'd just be nice if there was a bit of access to it. So the company was progressing. 1913, it employed a thousand people. John Mappin lived in London. And he was, he had aspirations much wider than Mappin and Webb. And at one point, he was almost thinking of setting up indoor shopping, shopping malls in the capital. He died suddenly in 1913 and he left 824,000. Again, in today's money, that's 97 million. He turned down the chance to be the Lord Mayor of London. But he was happy for his name to be, um, name a terrace, Mappin Terrace at London Zoo don't know again not familiar with London Zoo um some animals but I suppose some animals are sort of walking all over John Mappin's territory uh, in his memory William Joseph Mappin his son took over the chair in 1913 company was at the height in terms of its value um and its share capital was worth half a million pounds up to the equivalent of 60 million um Mappins were the most internationals of the Sheffield firms so they opened a mapping store in Sao Paulo, which was Brazil's first department store. 
Um, one of the catalogues, it shows they also had an office in Biarritz. So they really were all over the world. And I, I suppose it's, you know, whatever the rich and famous were, mappings were trying to sell them their, their rich luxury goods. You know, this next page, it could almost be the story of every single Sheffield cutlery company. <clears throat> At the start of World War I, I think we said earlier, Mappings had a thousand workers. In a four hour recruitment spell, 370 of Mappings workers, and I guess mainly it would have been the male workers, went to join the army. So if you can imagine, a third of their workforce almost overnight went off to join the army. And uh, a significant number of those would not have come back. Also at the time, um, the demand for luxury goods plummeted in a time of severe economic hardship. So the, it, all the silver plates and goods and all the luxury goods that Mappin's made, the demand for them went down very significantly. The other challenge was the steelworks on the east end of Sheffield, which were making, you know, massive armour plate uh, for our, our warships, were paying more money than people like Mappin's were for the uh, working on cutlery and hollowware. So there's a real, there's a triple whammy, if you like, for the, for the company in terms of its workforce. Factories adapted to light munitions and the war effort and they got government orders, so they were still working. Um, and the capital had actually increased to one and a half million by 1919. Again, that's 80 million today's money. They opened a new factory, the Royal Works in Queen's Road. Charles Eves, a London accountant, became chair. And they still had large contracts, hotels, clubs, military messes. You know, if you got a contract from the White Star Line or the London and North East Railway for cutlery, it was going to be a massive order. If you think about the number of um, military personnel that would have been in service in the First World War, between the wars and the Second World War, again, they would have been massive orders, but more massive orders for bog standard cutlery if you like rather than the, the luxury items which is probably where they were going to where they were going to make significant money 1933 herbert joseph mappin became the chair he was john's son died in 1946 the last mappin and actually i saw a photograph of this chap today somebody brought in this afternoon um died in 1959 1969 the group did include some other companies like gladwins um gladwins with the company uh, for instance, they'd made the, the silver for the Irish, the Irish state had been made by Gladwins, and they had, and the group had approximately 2,000 employers, and that was probably as big as any Sheffield Cutlery Company had ever got. But in 1963, Mappings were merging with other people. Elkingtons, whose fame had been that they invented silver plate and were very much a Birmingham company, and Walker and Hall, who were another company who, you might argue a bit like Mapping and Webb, they saw themselves as being the biggest and the best. So it's the problem with being the biggest and the best you have further to fall. And they all amalgamated to form British silverware. Now, and, and the old premises of Mapping and Web were sold to Vanda. Now, British silverware actually still exists. But I'd say in the meantime, since 1963, British silverware has been and gone and gone bust three or four times. British silverware currently uh, is on Attercliffe Road. Um, there's a there's the Sapporo group of precious metals. Uh, which is run by uh, Paul Tier and his wife Jackie Tier runs British Silverware. Uh, we were once privileged to go on a tour of British Silverware. One of the sad things was that in the Great Sheffield Flood, quite a lot of the um, the sort of patterns and some of the the moulds for some of the things that Mappin and Webb and Walker and Hall would have made um, were actually uh, were lost in those floods. It was interesting that once some Chinese some Chinese order was lodged with Mappin and Webb, and the Chinese wanted to see Mappin and Webb's works. And by this point, Mappin and Webb didn't have any works. So actually, British Silverware had to pretend that they were the Mappin and Webb works um, for, the, for them to get that order. So the merger founded 1971, the Sheffield factory closed. Um, the landmark London building was demolished in 1994. And Prince Charles wasn't very chuffed about that. And I think some, some not particularly attractive uh, building was placed in, put up in its place. Mappin, the Mappin and Webb name survived on luxury jewellery and silverware. 
The assets were brought by an Icelandic group, Bauga, and they went bankrupt in 2010, and the brand passed to the Aram Holdings. So if you now search Mapping and Web, you get something like this. <clears throat> so we've got Mapping and Web, and if you want to buy a Rolex and watch, they will sell you one. Clearly, they haven't made the Rolex watches. Um, so there's still a range of luxury goods made by Mapping and Web, and on their website, they'll make the point that they've got royal warrants. They'll make the point that their history goes back to 1810. Um, and I suppose they'll make the point that they've always been associated with quality. Um, probably no Sheffield connections left, I wouldn't have said to Mapping and Webb, but as I've said throughout this talk, lots of the time, they've actually been making that point that they're very much a, a London and they're a luxury goods market. Um, I thought this is the knife project, so we better just look at a couple of knife pictures. So, and so Mapping and Webb did sell knives. And the nice thing about Mapping and Webb is actually the mark on the Mapping and Webb knives is very significant. It's never a lightly etched mark. So you get this nice, substantially um, stamped mark. Um, and you could have, you know, you could have had the, the handles in a range of materials. If you were talking about dessert knives, you could probably have had them in silver. You could have had ivory handles, you could have had xylonite handles, and you can see the trustworthy mark on the left and the old corporate mark of the uh, Mapping Brothers on the right. Again, across the bottom, Queen Victoria Street, Regent Street and Oxford Street. Like many other Sheffield cutlery companies, you could get yourself a lovely um, sideboard or case absolutely full of cutlery in this. This was only, well, this, this was this was a 12, 12 place set, but I see you had 18 table forks in there. You've got your asparagus tongs, your cheese knives, 18 table knives, your fish carvers, um, and so it goes on. And um, yeah, you've got gravy spoons, coffee spoons, pair of large sugar tongs. But again, Regent Street, Oxford Street, Queen Victoria Road, all on the catalogue. Very little mention of Sheffield. Um, well, we've got some new people with us tonight, so just going to say a little bit as we finish about the Knife Project. <clears throat> the Knife Project came around because I was sorting out the knives at the Holy Collection, um, deciding what we should keep, what we shouldn't keep, how we should organise them. And I realised that we had knives with 800 different surnames stamped on them. Um, this is inaccurate now because probably during the life of the project, which has now been running about a year and a half, we're probably up to 1,200 different surnames. We originally thought of creating a physical knife wall, like a war memorial, where you would have gone down to the museum and you'd, in many cases, you'd gone and looked for your own name. The knives are all different sizes, however, and some of them are not easy to read because the etching's not very good. So we decided to make a digital product. And actually with COVID, that has been absolutely perfect. And a couple of the aims of this project, one was to get younger people into the museum and get excited about possibly seeing their own surname on a knife blade. And the other notion was that actually there are quite a lot of people in Sheffield who have got some information about the cutlery industry or firms or memorabilia that doesn't have great value, but tells a little bit of the story. And just today, this morning, somebody who worked for Richards has come in and given us a collection of maybe 50 pen knives and lots of catalogues and information about the company. <clears throat> and somebody who attended the earlier talk actually had quite a lot significant amount of information about mapping and web. And we do feel there's an opportunity at the moment just to capture these things. So, and, and again, sometimes it might be you've got something in the, uh, some information in the family and you don't want to part with it, but you'd be very happy for us to copy it. Or other, it might be you've got some things that you think the kids don't want these, but they might be of some interest in the museum. So we, we, we're, defi we're definitely interested in that, in that notion. And, and this, is the, this is the online tool that you can use your smartphone, you can use your computer. Um, you can also use two touch screens down in the gallery. So if you just put in Hawley Sheffield knives, very simple thing, then you can put the first, um, the first initial of your family name. And out of that, you can, you can see whether there was um, a cutlery company with your name on it. And I say, we've now got 1200 different names in there. I was really pleased last week, I led a lady to the screen and um, she was looking at the text and pointed to her name and said, that was my granddad. And that's, that's if you like exactly what we want to do. So by and large on there, we'll have a picture of the knife. We might have a bit of location information. All this history has come from a book by Jeffrey Tweedale. We're incredibly grateful to him for giving us this information. Um, and it does mean if you had an interest in a cutlery company, it's a way in which you could look that information up without buying a book that's 650 pages long.
So that's the name of the knife blade project. Um, we've we've catalogued something now like I think two and a half thousand knives, and essentially we think we have the biggest collection of table knives in the world. Um, there are obviously three cutlery collections in Sheffield. There's the Cutlers Hall that have a lot of nice, fancy and historical stuff. Um, there's the Millennium Galleries, again, they've got a lot, lot of nice, fancy and historical stuff. But the Hawley Collection, we're telling the story of how things were made and some of the more um, ordinary products, if you like. So um, you're very welcome to come and visit. Good news about Kellam Island, it's now actually free. Um, it's, it's, it's joined with the other museums, so it, there's a real opportunity there just to uh, just to come and visit. So um, that's the end of what I've got to say tonight. I'm very happy to, to answer any questions afterwards, um, either about mapping and web or anything just generally uh, about cutlery. Also worth mentioning, we've got a YouTube channel, the Ken Hawley Collection Trust. This talk will go on there afterwards. Some of our other talks are on there. 